Hey everybody, this is Dan Gonzalez and Joey Adams. Howdy. Today we want to talk about the Quad Curve EQ. Now the Quad Curve mm-hmm. EQ has been around for a while now. It's been around since Sonar X1. For those of you that uh, picked that up, you notice that's where we kind of started with the whole thing. But it's evolved and we've iterated it, iterated on it, that's a word and a phrase. Uh, we've iterated on it for a couple of years now. And it's kind of come to a point where it's really, really, really awesome. <laughs> and I know a lot of yes. people have been complaining about me saying really awesome. So I'm going to have to say something different. It's really fantastic. <laughs> it is also excellent and good. Oh, those work too. Wow. Yes. So <laughs> Yeah, I think this might be the unsung hero of Sonar even. It's like, it's definitely my favorite plugin, and it's on every single track. I, I'm pretty much guilty of using it on all the tracks. Yeah, totally. Uh, and I mean, you can even see so inside versatile. This, yeah, you can see inside the session that I have. I basically used it on every single one of my tracks in this drum, yep. this drum session. Um, yeah, it's it's really one of those EQs that uh, has a lot of power behind it, but you know, mm-hmm. without really getting a proper demo or a proper understanding of all the different settings, you kind of can't really. Uh, you just don't really notice it, mostly because, um, like, for instance, inside the EQ, the mode section, which is really powerful, it's not really available inside of the uh, Pro Channel version. So with the fly out and with all this wonderful uh, new kind of stuff that we've been talking about lately, I figured it'd be really cool to chat about uh, the power behind the Quadro EQ. Most EQs have a filter of maybe 6, 12, 18, 24, and it's sometimes 48 if it's like a mastering EQ. Yeah. Uh, This one has 6 dB per octave increments all the way from 6 dB per octave to uh, from 6 dB per octave to 48 dB per octave. So it's it's got a lot of uh, granularity, I guess you could say. And that's really that's relevant for me personally, because I tend to use EQ. Uh, subtractively when I'm first starting a mix. For me, something like a high-pass filter will be slapped right on the vocal, but instead Mm -hmm. of the high-pass filter being set to something drastic, which will just cut out all the low end, I like to kind of help take out the plosives and all the gross stuff, maybe the Mm -hmm. microphone moving in the room or the guy hitting the stand. All that stuff is kind of taken care of by setting it to a pretty, pretty uh, shallow, you could say, uh, setting, and then bringing it up to like 200, maybe a 6 dB octave setting. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, if I'm using a drum set, um, sorry, if I'm mixing a drum set, I'll set this thing, because I can, all the way up to 48 and shave off probably all the way up to about, mm, I would say around 350, 500. Uh, it looks sure. like 500, but on the setting, it's actually like 350. Regardless, mm-hmm. the idea is that you can consistently and cleanly shave out all that low crap you don't need. Um, and obviously, the same thing goes for the high-pass filtering as well. So yeah, I Absolutely. totally agree with you, man. It's it's a really flexible EQ in that regard. Um, you know, it's really, really crazy. Flexible. That's that's exactly the word I would use for this. I right. don't know any other EQ with this much, this, this many options for the filtering alone. It's just mind-blowing. Absolutely uh good <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um, and also swell and also swell but the swelling's <laughs> gone down the swelling has gone down <laughs> the way cakewalk has kind of developed things we've kind of talked about integration and that's our story we always talk about how sonar is constantly integrating these awesome tools like melodyne and drum replacer and all these wonderful things the pro channel great example well how could we develop a e- an eq that has tons and tons of flexibility, but has a very small form factor. Well, to do that, we decided to go with these four different modes. And that's kind of what happened with the evolution of this EQ. One of the great things about this is that we've introduced uh, different EQ, I guess, circuits into a single Mm -hmm. EQ, four to be exact. And the hybrid is actually our own kind of special sauce. So let's chat about that for a second. What does the hybrid actually mean, Joey? Very simply, it's not that simple. Thank you. You're you're <laughs> doing <simply>. exactly <laughs> what I was going to ask you to do. So the boost, uh, the additive EQ is a much wider uh, base curve than the base curve for the subtractive EQ. So uh, you know, obviously, both cues for your low mid and high mid are set to their standard one point three. Yeah. Uh, so you can, I mean, it's pretty obvious, uh, what's going on here. The, the cuts are much more narrow and the boosts are much broader for, I'd say that's a really good thing to use on things like drums, 
um, yep. you know, boosting the tone, but cutting annoying resonance and weird yeah. stuff well, like that. Honestly, I think that's that's kind of the that's kind of the hybrid kind of embodies mm -hmm. just the not the the documented like practice of using parametric EQ, but I feel like it does a great job at showing you that this practice is so uh, widely used, wide boosts and narrow cuts that yes. we've introduced the, that as the default hybrid. Uh, sorry, the default EQ setting in the hybrid format. And it's kind of, yes. you know, it's kind of useful because, you know, anything, anything for me at least does that. I, I'm always doing wider boosts than I am narrow cuts because that's just the way I EQ. Um, it's a much more musical sound. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It is. It is. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I love that. And I think it's great. And I think it's a, a great tool to have, especially considering it's the tool that you get right out of the box. Let's jump to the pure, right? What changed? What changed? Everything is wider. Everything is wider. Um, the resonance on the shelving is a little bit more present, uh, especially at higher cues. Uh, actually, go ahead and turn up the cue on the low shelf just for a quick example here. Sure. Now, remember, we're doing this all out of context of a mix just because we want to show you guys what this is actually doing. And that means that we yes. have to boost these settings maybe a little bit more than we would actually do. Uh, yeah, so do something super <laughs> drastic. Yeah. So we'll take a look at that and we'll bump that up. We can show yep. you guys what's happening here. Yep. So we've got a little bit more pronounced resonance on the shelves. Um, but what's pretty special about this EQ, other than it's, you know, it's really wide, uh, it's pretty hard to mess it up unless you're uh you know just messing it up but uh go ahead and adjust the gain on one of the mid uh filters there okay and you'll notice it might even be best to turn all the others off just for a quick demo sure. because what's what you're going to see is that the point gets a little bit sharper the more you add uh or subtract in this case hmm the base of the bell curve remains the same, but the point at which the uh, bell curve is centered is a little bit more steep as you increase and decrease the gain. This is called uh, proportional Q. Gotcha. Yes. And so you can see the difference between the hybrid and the pure. These are two vastly different sounds, yet they keep the mm -hmm. same exact Q. So in a sense, what you're doing is you're getting the same bandwidth, mm -hmm. technically, but the actual tone and the uh, the type of tone that you're getting is completely different. So that's, yeah. that's pretty awesome. It's a different and shape visually. I would say sonically it's a different color. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, how would you kind of describe this E-type? So the bell curves on the E-type are wider than the hybrid, but not as wide as the pure. Um, the, yeah. I see. Yep. Gotcha. Perfect. So, yeah, you can kind of see when you're switching there. And what's really unique about the E-Type, though, is the uh, the shelving is really cool. I like to use it for separation of, um, like, low-end and stuff. So, yeah, if you kick up that Q uh, pretty high, you'll see that at the... Right, there you go. So on the inside, I guess you could say, of the resonant frequency is a huge inverse. Yeah. And so that's really cool if you're, let's say you, I don't know, you want to clean up your uh, low end, your kick and, um, kick and bass guitar. This looks like something I might use on uh, bass guitar, you know? Yeah. Where i getting all the low end, like super, like 50 hertz and below kind of out of the way and boosting 120 roughly and above by making a cut, which is really cool. Yeah, it's really great for uh, isolating parts, and it's it's a good all-purpose EQ, uh, you know, the the sort of wide, uh, but not super, super wide uh, yeah. bell curves are really useful. I think useful. it's awesome. Yes. I think it's really cool. So the yes. E-type and the G-type, these are based off of uh, some famous British, uh, these famous British... Uh, analog consoles, um, they kind of follow the same curve that you would get in these two different versions of it. Obviously, mm -hmm. the E-type has its own special thing that we just kind of went over. And then the G-type, I would say, is probably the analog one, right? Uh, there's a pure and there's a G-type. Uh, mm -hmm. 
I would say for me personally, the G type is kind of more of that pure EQ tone. I know I don't know if that makes any sense, <laughs> but that's kind of that's kind of the yeah. way I look at it. You no, know what it's I mean? it's definitely a little bit of a cleaner, uh, more precise sound. So a lot of people ask, what's the deal with this gloss setting on the EQ? Well, I can tell you right now, it's a very subtle change. The reason why it's a subtle change is because if it were a drastic change. I probably wouldn't use this EQ, and a lot of people wouldn't because it does. It would probably do more damage than good. What sure. this is doing is turning on harmonics that exist in the upper, upper high range, like 10K and up. Harmonics that are, I guess you could say, air. You know what I mean? Like that air, that, definitely. That, yeah, it's kind of like that air, that EQ, that shimmer, that wonderful top end that a lot of people go after in their mixes. So... To kind of demonstrate what this is exactly, um, let's take our snare all group, which is the blue guy. And what you can, as you can see, I've duplicated it to this purple guy right here. Um, I'm going to mute that for now so you guys can just hear exactly what's going on with the snares. Listen to that. Mm -hmm. An old kid, of course. You can hear that. So that's just the snare tracks. Clone the track. Flip the phase. And turn on the gloss and what we've essentially done and of course solo it what we've essentially done is canceled out everything in the snare frequencies except for just the gloss setting that right. means that we're going to be able to understand what exactly this is it, it doesn't really make any sense to, to analyze it and understand like oh it's exactly doing this but we can get an idea of what it's doing because it's harmonics it's going to affect everything differently so when we listen to it in context to the snare track it's going to sound this way, or this is exactly what it's adding to it. Very subtle. In fact, I'll turn up the master so you guys can hear it even more. Very subtle. Essentially, what we've got is we've got, uh, I want to say, barely just a touch of harmonic distortion occurring at 10K and up. It's really, really, really subtle, but it's just enough to add in there that uh, if you want to add that top end. So this is relevant when you're mastering inside of Sonar, relevant maybe on a master EQ, or maybe on a vocal or a vocal group where you just want to add a little bit of harmonic distortion to everything. Uh, one thing I think we may want to touch on is something that I'm not sure a lot of people know about, and that's that you can pin this EQ. Oh, yeah, Why of is course. that useful, though? Well, let's try... Actually, can you try something for me? Sure. All right, so move the effects chain in your uh, in your pro channel above the EQ so that it's, it's hitting the effects chain first. Sure. Cool. And then I see you've got an EQ in there. That's actually really good for this example. So... Go ahead and open the fly out for the uh, for the quad curve, okay. and pin it. Okay. And now you can make adjustments on the other EQ, and see the see the way it affects the signal uh, on oh, the analyzer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. So you could essentially use this as an analyzer plugin as well if you, you could pin it. Exactly. Oh, that's cool. That's a really cool idea. I didn't. I, I never really thought about doing that. Um, if you guys don't have any analyzer plugins, you can actually just, yeah, that's a great way to, to kind of observe your mix. Um, if you guys are new to mixing, I don't know how many of you are, how many of you are not. Um, one great thing to do is to have an analyzer plugin on your master bus so you can kind of understand the shape of your mix. That's really important when it comes to producing great mixes. Not the most important part, but it's a reference for you. So, if you're in a place where you're trying to do some quick analyzation of what's going on in your track, uh, you can do that by, like Joey said, throw the analyzer, turn all the nodes off, and then start EQing if you have another EQ that you want to start using. So you can actually see the changes in real time. Um, we'll bring this up to like, you, know, you can see adding a lot of low end in there. Maybe mm -hmm. we can even make it a little bit wider and kind of understand what's happening in here. 
It's, it's really cool. good reference for just visual feedback. And like yeah. you said, especially when you're learning mixing, this is like invaluable. Starting to really understand how this EQ works and how mm -hmm. it can kind of affect and change your mixes, especially with these different modes, is a great way of uh, experimenting with new ideas in your mix. Most of you may have just stayed on the hybrid because you know that that's the default one for one reason or another. But we uh, challenge you to go ahead and check out the Pure, the E-Type, and the G-Type and tell us what your favorite EQ mode is as well because I have a favorite. Ooh, I just hit my microphone. I have a favorite. I don't know what your favorite is, Joey, but um, I always I'll never of, tell. You'll never tell. Okay, That's so we'll my never secret. tell. <laughs> so, <laughs> in the comments below, why don't you give us a, give us an idea of what uh, EQ mode you guys really like, and tell us how you use this EQ? Because for us, it for me, it's a subtractive EQ, it's an additive EQ, it's a master EQ, and it's a bus EQ. It does everything for me. But I'd love to hear what you guys have to say and any feedback uh, in relation to that. So. Definitely. We want to thank you guys for coming out and hanging out with Cake TV Live. This was a rather short one, but I think it was short and sweet. Wouldn't you agree, Joey? Straight to the point, man.